Hey, 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 everyone. Welcome back to the five day virtual summit. So today's day three, and this is session number two. And we have a special guest for you here. Let me just pull up her picture here so you guys can see. Uh, before I pull up her picture, let me just say that the five day summit is sponsored by the Ghost Slayer Show. And I am your host, Rosa Berriget, your online business coach, and I help aspiring and new virtual assistants start their business from scratch. So today we have an amazing topic, right? All the topics are amazing, right? But this topic is really amazing because a lot of us have kids that are going into either middle school, high school, and into college. And a lot of parents don't know like how they can better support their child in this process. And we're gonna talk a little more about that um, when our guests come in about like, you know, there's no an age limit when you can start the whole prepping your child for college. So let me tell you a little bit about her. Ah, let's bring this slide here. So let me tell you a little bit about my guest. Um, I known her for a few years now and she is totally amazing. Sorry about that other slide. So Gloria is, a dedicated professional with many, many years experience as a clinical social worker and over 10 years of experience as an advocate for uh, marginalized communities and individuals. She has recently worked at Norfolk County's Ju Juvenile Court as a forensic clinician. She is the mother of a high school senior and has supported him in the application process of applying to 10 colleges. And guess what? He received acceptance letters from nine of them. So kudos to him and kudos to mom. Gloria will be sharing with us today some of her lessons learned in the college process and how maintaining a circle of support and being patient was key to her son's success in the process. So guys, please help me welcome Gloria to the show. Hi, Gloria. Hello, Hola, Rosa. Hola, Gloria. How are you? I am well today, considering that we are actually in this pandemic right now of this craziness, but I am thankful and I am excited to be a part of your show today. Oh, thank you. Did I miss anything that you wanted to elaborate on in the introduction? No, I was thinking, oh goodness, I should hire her to be my uh, <laughs> <Your> PR. <laughs> So guys, this is gonna be uh, a sort of like an interview um, show because there were people that had so many questions and we gather the questions together and Gloria is gonna help us learn a little more about the process. If you are here, drop something in the comments. That's how we know that you're watching and that you're supporting the show and we are gonna give you a shout out. So the way that it's gonna go, we go I'm gonna ask her a few questions and as she is answering the questions, if you can think of something else that you want more explanation on, or you have questions of your own, post them in the comments. And at the end, we're gonna do a Q&A, okay? So Gloria, tell me a little bit about your college process with your son, briefly. So as you um, spoke a little bit about through this whole thing, my son is um, in a school in Brighton. He is actually in a private school in Brighton. And he was interested in studying psychology. We started talking about that really early on, probably in middle school, on what he wanted to do. And it was not, he did not identify psychology as one of his interests at that time. Um, as we continued our conversation, it evolved into psychology. So I was just really trying to just talk to him, encourage him to think about other careers that he could be. Um, possibly interested in um, as I went to school for um, my undergraduates in psychology. And I knew just from that process, in order to really make any type of a good um, salary, you should probably plan to go for your doctorate, um, at minimum, your master's. And I really wanted to explain that and talk to him about what is required to really be able to make a good living off being a psychologist um, and what type of degree that you need. So we had that conversation and I thought by having that conversation with him, it was going to change his interest, but it didn't. His interest level increased um, 
And he started thinking about schools and we started talking about what type of schools he wanted to go to. So it was a fluid conversation that we began to have very early on in his middle school days. So early on when you mentioned his middle school days, so it's not too early to start these conversations in middle school. Oh, no, I don't think so at all. When we actually started visiting schools and going into um, colleges and seeing the campuses, it was families there that had kids that were in elementary school. And you think to yourself, elementary school, that is way too early. But why not? They were just there along because they had an older sibling that was already in the process. So quite naturally, that family that parent, that caregiver brought them along and let them um, experience that. And to talk to them about why they were there, they seemed just as interested. Sometimes they were even more interested than the college prospective student was. <laughs> and that leads us to the next question. How and when does the parent begin the college conversation? So as early as middle school, right? And how do they start that conversation? Well, for me, the lesson that I learned very early on, I really want to talk to my son about what did he want to do. Before he identified psychology, I just want to talk to him about there are other trades. You know, not everyone is fit and equipped to be a college student. Let's mm -hmm. face it, right? It's funding, it's money that is involved in that. And a lot of stuff is based upon your your parents' income. And oftentimes, not all the time, you are blessed to be able to get a full ride, a scholarship, that you don't have to worry about the financial aspect of it all. Yeah. But the reality is that if you really empower them and inform them on the various different options, maybe it's an electrician, maybe it's uh -huh. an IT person, maybe it's someone that is a plumber, or um, maybe you just want to do iron work. That may not require the traditional forms of education, but there are things that you could do that could give you a nice career that you could live comfortably on and don't necessarily have to go to college. So mm -hmm. I wanted to have that conversation with them. So we started off thinking about what type of career would you want to have? And for me, a lot of people say, do, and I, I mean, I agree with it to a certain extent. Have a job that you really love and then you won't feel like it's work. Mm -hmm. But I think even more deeply with that, have a job that you really love that is paying you a comfortable salary that then you won't feel like you need to get another job that you hate to supplement it. Exactly. <laughs> so, so like having the conversation with kids about college, it's not always like you have to go to college, but like what is having like an open conversation about like, being that being curious about coming from a curious perspective about what do you want to do and like these are options you know college their trades and giving them options to see what they like open-ended conversations ask questions just be like i'm wondering what are your thoughts what are you thinking about what are your friends thinking about what do you think about their choices i mean ask those type of questions and try to engage them on that uh, and then if they give you a seed, like, you know, um, we had a career day at school today and um, someone came in who was an engineer and I didn't even realize it was various different types of engineers. So then you could be like, well, what type of engineer is it? Or then you can just ask prompting questions to get them to tell you more about it. How much do they pay in salary? I wonder how much, why don't you Google that and see how much they pay in salary? So get them to think about various different um, titles and career paths that they could have. And that would help them to think about what's the best fit for them. I agree. So let's move to the next one. How do you identify an adult to take the supporting lead when it comes to the student. So how do parents identify like who's gonna be that support person or support circle for this child? Right, every family, every household is different, right? So you may have someone in your household that have, you may have a parent that has never went to high school. I mean, never went to college or very well, they may not have graduated from a traditional high school. Maybe they got uh -huh. their GED, who knows? but they may have never experienced the college process. 
or they may not just be from this country. Maybe they're from uh, the Caribbean or they're from another country. Who knows? But if that is their experience, they may not be the best person to take the lead on that. So just be um, open and have conversations, communication with um, the caregivers, the adults that are in the household that is supporting this youth and your family to see who is the best person because it's going to take a village. And that's true. You hear it all the time. It's going to be some visits that you may not be able to take that ch your child to and someone else would have to support them in that, you know, or it might be your his friend's parent, you know, somebody else that could supplement and, and take your child and visit a campus. But as far as your household, have a conversation amongst the adults and think about who is the best person to go with them and to support them and engage them and, you know, get them to thinking about stuff that they may, you know, not normally think about. For me and my husband, it was myself because he is from the Caribbean. This process was foreign to him. He didn't even understand it. He didn't even understand why here in the U.S. that we have to spend all this money to go to college and not mm -hmm. pay attention and think about the expense that is, you know, associated with that. So he supported my son in the way of making sure that he he was there to help him check out the colleges. But as far as the application, filling out the forms, doing all those things, I was the one that took the lead. So just look at your dynamics and what happens and, and negotiate that amongst your family. And build from like, if it's a couple, each other's strength, like who's better at managing different things, right? Exactly. And for some parents not to get offended if that person happens to be someone that is not in the household, right? It could be a teacher, a counselor. It could be a teacher or a counselor. Like my son has this really great, he went to Nativity Prep in Jamaica Plain and he wanted to visit all these different colleges. And we applied to 10 of them. We saw all 10 of them. I was able to take him and see most of them. But the ones that I could not take him to go see, I outsourced some of those responsibilities, so to speak. For instance, he went on the HBCU, um, Historically Black College Tour, and he was able to see uh, a collective amount of colleges through that tour. How did I learn about that? Talking to friends, trying to talk to other people who have already went through this process and just asking, what, do, what did you do during that? Do you know any um, HBCU tours? And I learned so much about that process. So Why do they call the tour? It's the HBCU, Historically Black College. Mm, um, okay. So, and the Boys and Girls Club, um, I learned that the Boys and Girls Club do a HBCU um, college tour every year. So if you they are do. interested, do that. And my son went on, I believe it's called College Excursions. Um, and he went on it through them. They have a Facebook page. You can look them up on that. And that was where he went. So I, I utilized that. I outsourced that. I had, he went along with his friend who was going to visit colleges that he was interested in. And I partnered with his parent and said, listen, I understand that, you know, you're taking the kids, your son out. Is it possible for my son to hang out and go out with you guys? So that's what happened. So just talking to folks that is able to support you on things like that. Sometimes mm -hmm. We went as a family. Sometimes I went with them alone. So each each situation is different. It's different, yeah. That makes sense. And let's see, what process you employ in helping your child during the college search process? Oh, so I tell you, the process that you employ is, I'm telling you, it's just like kind of like your tips that you need to be aware of, of like really thinking about what you need to be able to get organized, situated, and just trying to think about what you have available to you, right? So it's different things that you have to think about. Organize and we got, and we're gonna cover some of those in the next slide when we're done with the questions, right? Yes. Yeah, so it's a whole bunch of stuff that just like it's this this process is condensed. I'm gonna tell you because this could be a whole maybe hour to hour series, if you will, um, <laughs> on the process because it's so much to to learn. And then right. I'll share some of the my favorite um, sites and tools of of some. Um, 
websites and agencies that I loved and helped me out tremendously through this process. But being organized is the number one thing um, to help. Because if you're organized, you're modeling that organizational skills for your child and being able to track and keep track of everything. Because you're going to need to keep track of all the information you're getting from the colleges, right? You're going to have to keep track of all the scholarships that your child is applying to. So if I don't know if you're computer savvy, but if you are, just be able to list and write down. My house turned into like a, a, a wall collection. I purchased large post-its and I put them on the wall and we put different colleges up on each of those post-its and we would list some of the things he liked and didn't like about those colleges. We list the scholarships that he applied to. And then it gives you a visual of what needs to be done, things that you have to get done, things that you want to check into. So being organized and having a system that works for you. For me, it was the large post-its initially, right? So I could collectively visually see something. So he could collectively visually see things and in his mind visually be organized on what needs to happen. And then when we fine tuned and got some kind of an understanding of some schools that we were going to apply for, because I'm going to tell you, the list went from like applying to the uni University of Hawaii. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> to applying to Curry College, which is like maybe 10, 20 minutes away from my home because I live in High Park. So, I mean, it's it's a very, right? How realistic I had to say to him for you to go to Hawaii. Yeah, what if you got a scholarship? That would be awesome if they gave mm -hmm. you a full ride. But how often are you coming home, <laughs> right? Like how often are you coming home um, on the weekends? Not, probably not. So just being realistic in that, of just helping them sift through the process, because it's a major, major, huge decision for them, and that they need to really understand it, because this is going to be the first time that they're independently without you supporting them, making all these decisions and reminding them to do all these things. So letting them know that, yeah, this is a big decision. This is a big one for you to think about. Yeah, this is when things are going to get real about adulthood already. Yes, absolutely. So, you know how kids always, I say kids because I have a 14-year-old and he's already telling me, he plays basketball in a travel team and he's already telling me that when he goes to college, he's going to go to UConn and he, him and his buddies, his little gang friends, um, he's bro, bro, they have a bromance where they hang out and they're always talking about what they're going to do when they graduate high school. They're going to go to high school in September, go willing. So how do you walk your child through the process of like what schools you should apply for, what school you shouldn't? So I guess the real question is that how was the process for you when selecting schools with your son? I'll let him take the lead in that, right? Because I want to know what he's thinking. The communication is always fluid. We're always talking about that. And then I challenge him with open-ended questions. I want to pick his mind and I'm asking him questions of like, hmm, why did you pick that school? Because in my mind, I want to know, are you picking this school because your friends are all picking this school, right? Mm -hmm. And also in my mind, I'm thinking, are you picking this school just because oh, you want to be in this area and you just think it's a party school and you want to go and hang out and not be focused on you. So, you know, I, I'm not going to verbalize that to him, but I'm going to hold all these questions in my mind and ask questions to get him to then engage with me in a conversation so then I could be like recording those <laughs> answers in my brain, right? And holding that in mind because you have to think about academically which what schools he actually um, fit for. And, and there are different types of schools. And when we think about colleges, you have to think about it in the sense of like a safety school. A safety school is like a school that may, um, that usually pretty much takes a large majority of the, 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 the students who apply for the application. So their SAT and their GPA matches. Um, you know, it's it's like they're the they the they are the ideal student for that. You know, accepted student that would come into a Pacific safety school, right? So that may be considered a safety school. Um, 
the match school is typically known as that perfect fit. All your all your GPAs, all your stuff is um, it aligns with the ideal student that that school usually takes. But it doesn't necessarily mean it's a guarantee that you're automatically going to get into that school. So yeah, you have the safety school, which you're like, oh, this school takes SATs of like um, what eleven twenty. And my son's SAT is 1170 something, right? Um, I know that this is a safety school for him because his GPA is 3.0 and, um, I mean, 3.5 and the average student is 3.0 that gets into the safety school. So mm -hmm. I don't know the likeliness of him probably getting into the school is good. Then for the match school, it could be that the match school typical um, accepted student may have a SAT of 1,200, and then their GPA might be 3.9, almost 4. And then your child may be right at that number, right? Their test scores was right at that number, their GPA right at that number. That could be a perfect match for them, right? Yeah. Would that mean they're automatically guaranteed submission? No, because you don't know how many students have applied and they have their own quota of things that they need and don't need once to get in. And then you have the REACH school. The REACH school is this ideal candidate, the student that is coming into that school might have a 1600 GP, I mean a 1600 SAT and a 4.0 or higher, right? Um, mm -hmm. GPA. And they may be the Ivy League schools or like really the high reach schools that I mean, would they take somebody that has a um, 1200 or 1400? Maybe, you know, with a good GPA, but it's a, it's a reach school, which means it's like kind of a roll of the dice on whether or not you can get in or not. So that was the next question, but you explained it very well. <laughs> so back to this question, right? Because I go, I run into this with my son sometimes selecting the school. So what happens if a child, let's say, you know, that, mm, let me see, like the basketball, right? Or a child and you're asking him like, why you want to go to that school? Well, they have a great basketball team or I'm going to be there for four years. And I want to make sure I, I love, you know, I want to make sure that they have a good cafeteria. I want to make sure that they have a basketball court within the, the school. Those, I'm just making things up, right? But then they're telling you all these things as you're talking to them. So how do you coach them into like researching those things? Not just saying this is what I want without knowing already if the school that they're advocating with you that they want to go to have those things. How do you coach them without telling them to do certain things? So I had to talk to my son about what is it about this school that you like, right? So I wanted him to build his own um, picture of this school. Like he has to sell the school to me. He has to convince me that this is where he needs to be. He has to convince me that he wants to go to the school because he feels like this is going to give him the best education, the best leverage for him to launch, to do what he needs to do to be an independent, responsible student. Because I tell him, I want you to prepare like you're not coming back to my house, right? Because I'm excited because I'm going to be it. <laughs> so I want you to be able to stand on your own feet. I want you to be able to go to a school, choose a career that's going to afford the lifestyle that you're comfortable and you want to have because your mother is not going to be providing and supporting you throughout your adult years. So let's just be clear right. on that, right? You, I'm, I just want you to know that. So you're going to challenge them to really think about what they want and if this school is going to give them what they need. For instance, what if your child is a student that has only really been in small setting schools, right? But most of the schools that they're thinking of, right, maybe 50% of them or 55% are large schools. Mm -hmm. Maybe he went to a school that had his senior class had like 60 people. But you're going to a school that has over 10,000 or 11,000 people. What does that class size look like, right? Mm -hmm. He could go from a class size of being in a room with maybe um, 
anywhere from 15 to 21 students, which is a lot, right, in his school because he's in a private school. That's a lot. They could also go to a college class that has a lecture style stadium classroom that could have 300 plus students, or it could have 400 students, or it could have 100 students, or it could have 50 students, or it could have 30 students. So it's different colleges that have some classes that are that large. But mm -hmm. you have to be able to ask him or ask your student or their child, like, so what are the class sizes like, right? To get them to think about, oh, like, I don't know. Or they'll be able to give you that feedback of, yeah, this is smaller classroom style. Or what does the teachers, how do they teach? Uh, is it lecture style or is it like more of a group discussion? Is it something mm -hmm. that you are going to be engaged in that learning material, that curriculum, your syllabus that you get? And just reminding them and helping them to think about it, that it's going to be different than high mm -hmm. school, right? Well, now some schools are now giving them their coursework and then giving them their deadline dates and telling them when it's due. That's the reality of what it mirrors in the college. But yeah. If they don't get those opportunities in their current high school and they go into college and then they get their syllabus and they know that they have a paper, nobody's calling them to say, did you do that paper? I nobody's calling them. And no, I tell my son that all the time. And nobody's calling your parent to remind yeah, them exactly. that you're not turning in your work. <laughs> and not only that, even if you were that parent, as they would call you a helicopter parent, right? <laughs> I could be a helicopter parent sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> that you want to call the school and be like, did he go to class? What is his grades? You're not privy to any of that information anymore, right? No. They'll tell you that your child has to give you permission and they have to sign this document for me to be able to share this information with you. So it's a whole nother ball game and it's a whole different process. So engage them and ask those open ended questions to get them to tell you what you need to hear. So you can then support them and give them more questions to think about to find out the answers to. Great. So this leads me to the next question, right? So what about those parents, helicopter parents, like myself sometimes, not all the time. So helicopter parents, like we're always like hovering over the child, right? Making sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do. Even though we have raised them to do what they're supposed to do, we still not don't trust that they're going to do what they're supposed to do. So what about those parents? that have a very hard time letting go, right? And allowing their child to explore within the state or even worse, out of state. Uh, what can you say to those parents? You have to know your student. You have to know your child. You have to know that individual. So for me, it was not a hard decision for me to be open to my son being able to go in state or out of state. My preference was I wanted him out of state. And everyone who knows me were really shocked that I said that. Because they were like, what? I know you didn't just say, you're going to be in tears. You're going to be sad. You're gonna Especially be for those that don't know you, that's your only <laughs> child. <laughs> right? So I was like, yes, that's true. I may be sad. I may be in tears. I may be all of those things. But the difference for me is, and, and for folks who you know are viewing this, um, a little caveat to this whole story is I'm so excited about this process because my son was a preemie. So he was less than a pound and they didn't even think that he was going to make it here and be here. So these milestones in his life that he's experiencing, it's a little different for me. I'm like mm -hmm. celebrating those with him. This is like my big adventure for him. I look at that as this is like, could be my last hurrah final project of being able to be <laughs> as involved with him mm -hmm. on some of the really life-changing decisions that he would have. So my influence may be the last real critical influence I may have because once they go off to college, they evolve into their own person and they come back with a whole different perspective of life. So you have to know your child. I mean, he, my, my child has done, um, has traveled abroad with his school and with our church independently with me and without me. So I know that he's able to be responsible enough to manage his money and to control um, his body and his self um, as he does these things. So you have to be able to prepare them for these things. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you're preparing yourself because it's going to give yes. you that peace and that confidence to know that they will be okay 
not in your mm-hmm. The best compliment a parent could get is for someone to see their child when they're not around and then give them some report of how fantastic or how well-spoken or well-mannered that per- that child is when that parent is not around. Mm-hmm. That's going to be a hard pill to swallow for me, but I'm getting there. <laughs> How did your son decide to submit his applications? So it's a couple of different processes on how you could do your applications, right? So you have early action and you have early decision. And he decided that he was going to do all his applications on um, early early action, which meant that he was sending them in. It's non-binding. You're not committed to anything. You send the applications in and he was ready. He knew what schools he was interested in. He had his priorities of which ones he wanted, which ones he didn't. And in his mind, he just wanted to get that information in, get those applications in, and then be at peace that then he would really be able to hone in on what he wanted from each particular school. He'll be able to have longer time looking at the schools, getting the decisions, seeing what he wanted. And it allowed him the time to not really worry about meeting other deadlines. So he completed all his applications and submitted them early in November. So by December, he had all, most of all of his colleges had notified him whether or not he had gotten in or not. Uh, not, or if he was um, pushed over to the um, regular decision. Oh, wow. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. And kudos to you, mom. And I'm going to tell you, I would love to take <laughs> take credit for all that. But I was even nervous in that process. That's why I said, parents, this is a learning process for you guys. Like, it was okay for me to just be like, I don't know. Let's figure this out together. But I was worried because I was like, wait, you're applying all these schools you're doing early um early action for light and and why why are you doing he's like i just want to get it done and over with i can do these applications i can submit it then i can just focus on scholarships and i don't have to worry Mm -hmm. about it and i was like but wait what happens if you don't get into early decision does that mean that they'll send you to the regular decision because remember early decision has to be the application has to be in by november 30th what happens if you don't get accepted in that pool um, which is sometimes a smaller pool than what the regular decision applicant pool may look like. So I was going to ask you that. Like, can you explain the early action versus regular decision? So the regular decision will let you know you will have to submit your application in the newer year. So early decision, you have to submit it by November, and then you learn whether or not you got accepted by December, the latest early January, right? The regular decision you might have until like February to late January to February to submit your application. But then you start learning whether or not you got accepted into that school in like late February, March time area, right? Now, what does that mean? That means you have to be able to give the colleges a decision on whether or not you have accepted that seat by May 1st. Now. Because of this whole pandemic that we're in right now, some of the colleges are, are um, notifying applicants and their parents that they're extending it to June and July. We haven't gotten that notice yet. <laughs> to <end laughs> the colleges. So um, for my child, we would have to submit by May 1st on what, what school he's going to. But think about that. If you, if you applied in November and you learned what schools you got accepted into into December or January, You have until May to make that final decision, right? So that's the difference from early action, early decision. Now, regular decision, you apply in January. You may learn that February or March, but then you have until May to make that decision. You see the difference? Yeah, that makes sense. To give you a little bit of perspective on what it looks like. And it, it relieves some of the pressure for my child. It gave him it relieved some of the pressure for him. Like he he was so much at ease. And when his friends were like stressing about completing applications and doing scholarships, he was really like taking his time being chill and cool. And for you folks who know me and know my child, like he is just soft-spoken and just really like calm. And He's cool. really laid back. Very laid back. Mm-hmm. Totally not me. Um, <laughs> so I, I 
really was proud to see how he managed that process. And it, it actually taught me a lot and I learned a lot from it myself. Mm -hmm. So one of the last questions before we go to the audience and take some questions, if you guys, there's some people, um, I'm doing a watch party on my Facebook um, page, my personal one. So there's some comments that I'm going to read to you in a second. But the last question before we go to um, this other slide that you have is how do you support and encourage self-care during the process, not just for your child, but for yourself? Uh, listen, I cannot stress enough. Know your circle of friends. Know who you can call and talk to that have been through this process that you can lean on to give you support. Not all the time it's your partner in the house. It does not have to be your partner in the house. Like, mm -hmm. know who to tap into. You know how they say you have friends that you would call for different things, for different reasons, for different mm -hmm. seasons. Think about that. Think about that whole process of who you need to um, start, start building your tribe now. Build it, build it, build it, and know who you want in your tribe. Know, play to their strengths. The same way you would play to your the, the strengths of your partner on who's going to support your child through the process, play to the strengths of your friend. Right? <laughs> Just know what friend is going to be helpful for certain situations and what you need from them. And just be like explicit and say to them, girl, I'm going to need you to help me with this because I don't know if I'm mm -hmm. going to be able to do this. Or I need you to remind me when I get stressed and I'm high level to tune it back a notch because I'm really struggling with this task. Mm -hmm. Those are some things that you can do. Don't be afraid to step away. Revisit things at a later time if you feel like your anxiety is building up. Mm -hmm. So before we start the Q&A, this is a lot of good information. Before we start the Q&A, let me just go over to the comments. So Laverne said, hola. Hi, Laverne. Oh, yeah, Laverne. <laughs> so let me look here on my laptop that I turn into a tablet now. So Paula says, hi. Hi, Paula. She was the guest speaker um, last night. Norma says, hi. Hi, Norma. She said, hi. So nice to see you. Hi, Norma. Natalie, who was the guest speaker um, at noon today, she said, amazing mom, giving them independence is the best thing ever. It's important not to take our feelings and burden out our children with them. Good job, mom, to you, Gloria. And Natalie also said, you also want to go to school for something they, you also want your kids to go to school for something they love. She agrees with you. She remembers when she first started college, her mother told her that the same thing. So... She forced herself into nursing and hated it. Yeah. So she says she almost dropped out of college altogether because she felt like she let her mom down by not going into a high paying career. So that's something to keep in mind. You know, when you um, are promoting or well, promoting, encouraging your kids to go to school, it's a really, are you, you know how you said, Gloria, you want the your child to go to school and do something that he loves that also is gonna bring him the income that he probably wants to do whatever in life, right? Right. You, are you suggesting that your child go to college because of that? Because, you know, it's what he wants. Or are you suggesting your child to go to college because it's what you wanted? Let's say you wanted to be a lawyer. So now you're pushing your son to go to school to be a lawyer when it's not what he wants. And I think that's I what Natalie. That's healthy. And that, that's, that's my clinical piece of being a professional uh, um, social worker speaking to that as well as a parent. Because your dreams are your dreams. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Your child needs to experience their own dreams. And you need to afford them an opportunity to be able to make choices and see if those choices fit for them. They may think that this is the best career ever, and then they get into the career and hate it, right? But mm -hmm. how would they ever know if they don't explore it? So if they want to go and do these things, encourage them to start early and start talking to people in that career and seeing if they could, like, get mentors that are in that career or if you could connect them to people that are doing some of that work because you may think that it's a fantastic career. You get involved in it and then think, oh no, I don't want to do this. The mm -hmm. same could happen with the with the major that she sub that that child sub um decides that they want to do when they go to college. And they can start taking the classes and then get into it might do a study abroad that may give them some like volunteer experience or they may have an opportunity to do some um behavioral rehearsals or do some type of a, 
uh, show them some type of a peekaboo lens into that career path. And then they experience it and be like, I don't want to do this. That is completely okay. Because you would rather that happen until now, earlier in the game, than yeah. four then years, five years later. And for my child, my son, he wanted to do psychology, which may require, which is going to require him at least a minimum of a master's degree, right? So the, the, these were conversations. I wanted him to think about schools that when he would be able to go to and that would have a three plus two year that he can just kind of go straight through. Because I know sometimes life happens and if you take time off, sometimes you may not go back. So think about and helping them think about some of these things is always helpful. So mm -hmm. I don't think that they should be going off of your career path, but just going off what they may be interested in. I agree. And let me pull up this comment because it goes, it ties into that. So Tavia says, you know, make sure, piggyback on what you're saying, make sure that they do not regret it after they graduate with college loans and no good job prospects. Saying this is a, it's a theater, um, she's saying that as a theater graduate. Well, I'm going to tell you, when I talk about knowing your friends, tapping into your resources and outsourcing it, that was one of the best things I could have ever done because Funding and paying for college is ridiculous. And um, you guys will get a link of some I, some really great resources, cause um, edu, and they have a fantastic um, website that does, um, they call it crowdfunding, where they help you be able to identify um, funding for your um, child educational experience and they partner with you and consult with you to support you through that process. Um, the most fantastic support you could get, it's worth it. They have websites, they have tutorials, um, workshops that you can learn and advise you. I cannot promote them enough. And I just feel like personally, it was a, a blessing for me to get um, to learn about this agency. So I was really excited to share that. I hope that you will have the same experience. Look into it, um, navigate through their website so you can then be able to see all the services and supports and things that they have. All my resources that I listed, I personally have used and helped me through this process. And like I said, it's so many more that could be um, listed on these things but it would take so much time. But I was just trying to give you guys really concrete, solid resources, um, companies that I know I could attest to that they provide excellent customer service and is able to support our youth and our um, children to be successful in this process. I would love to take all the credit for being able to make sure that my son um, application and essays were on point. But I also that I had Iri Lux, which was another agency, a, a resource that you're going to learn more about, um, or you can see their website and their link that you can look to. That um, the CEO Robert came in like body, and he supported my son with working and doing his essays, and it was the best thing I could have done because I tell you, your kids test you, right? Because you you know what you would like, and it's. Sometimes you got to step back and just be mom and not be the one that's holding them accountable for every single thing. And when you step back and just be mom and yet still supporting them in that process, Rosa and I talked a little bit before we came on and we, we really believe in a model that we've learned when we worked as um, colleagues together was under the wraparound process of do for, do with, cheer on. You are afforded that when you, outsource that responsibility because you're able to do for, do with, and do to cheer on with your child do that. And you don't have to be the one saying, did you do the essay? Did you apply for that scholarship? Did you, do you're not hounding them. Somebody else is doing that. So you're just being informed of the process and it takes so much stress off of you. That is self-care 102. <laughs> that is self-care 102 i love it so let me go to some of the comments on my regular page so tavia said that her um her kids learned from from what she went through when she went to college going to a career as a theater graduate and then not having a good job or not finding a good job uh, not liking it 
She said her kids learn from that and they are now a massage therapist and a teacher. Wow, that's excellent. So let me go to my page. Let's see. So Chantel said, hey, um, Chantel, Chantel said she loves it. She said, what is, she, you, you explained it. She was asking, what is it on um, do for, do with? Love that. What what was it? Do for, do with? Chiron, um, Chantel, let me put the banner there again. Oh, I deleted the banner, but it's actually um, do for. So do for is when you're doing something for the, Gloria, you want to explain it? When you're doing something for the child. So do for, yeah, do for is when you're like, doing things for the child, right? You're telling the child, like, listen, and I'm gonna tell you, these things could apply to your personal, professional life as well, right? That was another lesson I learned. So when you're doing for your child, you're showing them the way, you're coaching them, you're you're showing them how to do things. You wanna show them the correct way of doing it, the correct way to send an email, the correct way to have a conversation, the correct way to follow through, the correct way to confirm things. You wanna coach them in that process. So you're doing for with them. And then you want them to be able to show you that they're able to do it, right? And then that goes into the do with process. So that do for, you're taking a lead on all of that because you're modeling that for them, right? do with, you're kind of supporting them in that process. You want them to now reverse that and take the lead and do all those things that you modeled for them to show you that they can do it, right? Mm -hmm. That's the do with. The cheer on is you're going to stand back and watch them and show them and coach them in the far distance. You're along for the ride. You're experiencing this road trip with them. And you're just cheering them on in that process. You did a good job with that. I like how you followed through. Thank you for sending me that email. Thank you for looping me in on that um, appointment, sending me that point reminder. You're cheering them on and giving them that feedback that things are actually going the way that you want them. Oh, I thought about this. Did you think about that? And you could give them little reminders of stuff that they might have not thought of. It's mm -hmm. all about uh, that fluid communication. Be flexible, be open, but know that this is all a new experience and a learning experience for both of you. And think about it, how we used to explain to our wraparound families, think about it as a car trip, right? Yeah. It's a journey, you're going on the road and you're in a car. So as the mom, you, are, you get in the car, when you start in the process, you are the driver and your child is the passenger and then you start the process of college applications and you know life skills and all of those good things and then at some point you're going to switch seats your child's going to be the driver and you are going to be the passenger yep. and then at some point towards the end now you're going to get off the car and they're going to drive on their own but you're still going to be waving at them and cheering them on yep. right exactly exactly so let me read some comments from my regular facebook page so let's see. So Chantel says, yep, I'm so far removed from where I started as my college major. Don't want my son to get caught up in that. He has to do something productive, constructive that can support him, but it's his choice to an extent. LOL. We know Chantel. <laughs> <laughs> Paula says hi. Hi, Paula. Um, Natalie. Let me see what Natalie said. Hold on, because I keep clicking on things here on my little tablet. Natalie says, so true, sell the school to so true you know make your child sell the school to you and she also says scholarships are amazing um ria says hi hey ria. ria let me go back to the comments here this one's so you can actually see i actually posted in the comments the link about growth crowdfunding for college so you guys can click on it and see what gloria was talking about laverne says also touch on organizations or also like reach out to organizations and companies um and maybe your friends that have work that may be offering scholarship for kids um for your child yeah um, her daughter just went through the process last year and received two out of five total from organizations oh, she received cool. scholarships and she said other scholarships came from high school and college That's kudos cool. to you you did an amazing job laverne with her i met her daughter before She's and beautiful. That's a good point, Laverne, because like I said, my son went to Nativity Prep in Jamaica Plain and they have a, a graduate support program. So we kind of went through this process twice because we were we had to kind of do this process as we were looking for private schools for him, right? To go into high school. 
So the graduate support, and, and anybody's looking for middle school, it's an all boys school, but it's a fantastic um, experience for your kids. So, What's the entering grade? Because I remember I asked you one time for my son, is it fifth grade? I think it's it, oh, it, fourth. It's fourth or fifth. They just changed it. So it might be fourth now. So it may be fourth through eighth grade now. So when I was looking to into scholarships, I contacted the graduate supports, um, Mrs. Frias and, and Nativity Prep, to learn about what are some scholarships because I was already using um, Cause Edu, and then I was always I was also using um, Scholarly. Is it Shell? I can never pronounce it. Um, the website on the um, thing Scholarly, at the app to get scholarships. And I was just like, wait a minute, am I missing anything? So I reached out to them, and I learned that. Nativity offers um, their graduates scholarships. So they have benefactors that support the boys once they graduate and get accepted into, col uh, into their college of choice. And they have to be accepted and accepted the seat. But I mean, every little thing counts. Every little thing adds up. So reach out to them, talk to them and see what opportunities that they have available to you. And then allow your child to do those applications and get the things done. Awesome. So I was looking at the name of the, it's called my, my scholarly dot com. Scholarly. Yeah, I called it. Yeah, it's, it's my and then S C H O L L Y dot com. If you guys want to look into it, I'll post it in the comments when we're done here. Um, and the other tip is when they were going, when my son was, studying for his SAT and his ACT. He took both of those with resistance, but he took both. His school encouraged him to do both. But when we used um, Kane Academy, I was pleasantly surprised with the stuff that Kane has. Um, even now, when I go and look on their website, they have really great um, webinars and tutorials for parents on there. I used it when I was in graduate school. So don't sleep on in academy i'm telling you guys you may want to even you would learn something um on your own um besides the process of helping your child for college cool so let me go let me see if there's no more comments here so let's go into we went way over our time we're gonna go into the last thing so gloria and i put together this um infographic that are some tips for parents and she's gonna briefly gonna explain to you what this thing is and then I'm going to post a link. It's a PDF file that you can actually print at home and keep it for yourself. So here it is. So the first six are very self-explanatory, right? Um, you want to go through them, Gloria? Do you have them up on the screen? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. We talked a little bit about identifying your resources available to you, right? Like kind of knowing your team, knowing your tribe, knowing who and what and where, right? You want to be able to speak to each of your friends' abilities and knowing what you could help and solicit from them. So if you have a friend that's actually doing some of this work and you trust them and respect them and know that they're going to advise you, you know, call them up, talk to them, solicit their support and stuff. And then you'll be able to ask them, this is what I'm struggling with. These are some of the challenges I have. That was how I learned about some of the resources that I had. I had a friend when I was stressing about working with my son on his applications. I was just managing in my new position, trying to, you know, get that, get my foundation good on this new position and also help my, my son do his college process. Feeling extremely, extremely stressed and having a conversation with my girlfriend. I'm saying to her, this is what I'm having challenges with. And she was like, why don't you call this person? This is what they do all the time. This is what you do. And, and I was able to link in and get the support that I needed and outsource the service. So identify your resources that are available for you and don't be afraid to tap into them and use them. The next one is think about the process as your biggest adventure. We talked a little bit about that. Like, that might be your last big hurrah, right? That might be the last time that you're able to be able to think about, wow, I'm able to help them or them 
or that's what Troy's depressed with, right? Get into college. So think about it as in, well, I'm able to help you get you engaged. I want to give you as much information as I can. I want to challenge you to think about as much as you could. I want you to think about all these things that you may not necessarily want to think about. So you want to make that the biggest adventure. You don't want it to feel like a task. You don't want it to feel like a project. You want it to be exciting. You want to be open to the process. And you want to partner with your child as in you guys are doing this together. Embrace it. Go with it. And don't be so stern like you're the one dictating and driving everything. Allow some mobility to be flexible, right? Also, you do not want to compare yourself to others. And I often encourage my son about this too, right? You may hear some feedback from his kids saying, well, this one's doing this, or this one's going here, or this one's going yeah. You know, no, 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 no. That's their situation. Well, this one got this scholarship, and now they said that it only cost them that much. Each family, each household, each situation is different. Do not compare yourself to other parents. Encourage your child not to compare themselves to other kids. Each person is individual. A lot of these things are based upon what that college needs at a time, what they're looking for, what type of funding they have available, what their endowment looks like. It's a lot of things that is that factors into it. So don't compare yourself to what someone else has, right? Mm -hmm. But also know that if you get a number through financial aid and you get your financial aid package, and it may not be what you expect it to be or may want it to be, especially in this situation, what I've also learn but some folks losing their position in their job you, it's it's acceptable and it's okay to be able to call the school and say well a major thing has happened with our income and i want to talk about if and how this may affect my child from entering into college and is it any other additional funding is there any other additional scholarships that i could have applied for or know about mm -hmm. i have my son's school call me and ask me you know, I'm just checking in to see if everything's okay, how you guys are doing, if you guys needed any additional funding. And I was even taken aback because I was like, ooh, well, what do I say? Like, what number do I give? What do I, like, I didn't even know what to say about that. I had to like think about it and say, well, let me follow back up with you and assess the situation because you want to be able to be um, reasonable. But I just thought that really spoke to that institution, you know, that they were able to reach out. So, also, um, give, that's a shout out to Leslie. Leslie College, Rocky, was fantastic. He's just a fantastic, it's a hidden jewel for Boston residents, I tell you, Leslie University. The other thing is know when to outsource your responsibilities. I, you have the list of resources that I loved and I use. Um, if, if your funding, if your money is right and you are able to outsource that, um, a role or responsibility, do it. I cannot encourage you enough to do it. Because like I said, being there and just playing the role and wearing the hat as the parent and not having to wear the hat as the enforcer will be a whole different experience for you. That will be less stressful for you. And I'm sure your child would appreciate it too. So really, you know, be able to know what the roles and responsibilities are and be clear, you know, just be explicit and to say what your expectations are and, and, and talk to your kids about that too. And your son about your daughters about it and say, you know, I just want to be mom in this. I want to be able to support you through this process, but I am also holding you accountable for these mm -hmm. things. And if you yeah. make a decision that I don't really understand, I'm going to challenge you in that process. And I'm going to ask you to let me get to that place where you're at. And if you can't get me to that place, then we need to have a mutual ground that, you know, we're going to have to be able to meet at because I am supporting you, but I'm not going to stand by and let you make a decision that I feel like is going to affect you in the long run. So really mm -hmm. being able to maintain fluid conversations, be honest, be open. And if your child is anything like my child, he would then challenge me and be like, no, mom, I just don't really feel like this is it. I really don't feel like this is the best fit for me. I really don't think that this is where I want to be. And this is why. And it took a little bit of getting used to <laughs> of receiving that feedback from him. But at least 
I feel like now I'm, I'm like, okay, at least I can see that he's practicing some self-efficacy. He's able to advocate for himself, right? So then I'm seeing him do that. So welcome the openness and be flexible to be able to have and expect change. Because one minute they might be like, oh, I want to be an engineer. And then the next month it might be like, oh, I want to be an architecture. And then the next week it might be, Oh, I don't want to go to school. I just want to do a, a vocational trade. I just want to be an IT person. So I want to be a rapper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So be open, ask questions, and just be able to just be really candid and what your expectations are. And you guys are going to have this. Um, we, we're running out of time, but you guys are going to have this um, infographic. I'm going to post it in the comments where you guys can. It's going to be there as a picture and also as a PDF where you can download it. And I suggest you download it as soon as you can because sometimes, you know, things get deleted from Facebook. So you guys are going to have it. If you have questions at the bottom of the, let me just show you. At the bottom here of the infographic um, is Gloria's um, contact information. So you guys are able to get in touch with her. So Gloria has um, an email address that she was nice enough to provide for us. So this is her email address, Gloria Weeks at iCloud.com. And a phone number where you can reach her, 857-244-1425. Gloria, are you on Facebook or Instagram where people can follow you? I am not, but I should probably do that. But you could, those are the best, best methods to reach me at this point. The email, email address and phone number. If you don't answer, feel free to leave a message. Well, thank you, Gloria, for this amazing um, resources. We learned so much today. And those other resources that she mentioned, I have not posted them yet, but I will post them after the live. So you can have them along with the infographic. Thank you, Gloria, for coming on to the show Hi. and for dropping some nuggets for those of us that have kids that are either planning to go to school or we're just starting the early conversation to explore to see what their options are. Yeah. Thank Good luck. Let me know how you guys are doing in the process. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Bye.